This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. Over the past 59 years, Doctor Who has been consistently on the air for 43 of them. With that type of staying power and prolific success, there have been many attempts to branch out into the show's wider universe, and this makes a lot of sense. The show's format of constant renewal and a rotating cast of leading actors, as well as its time and space hopping storytelling, means that the possibilities are endless. However, there's been a mixed track record with trying to sustain these projects. Back in the 1960s and 70s, Dalek creator Terry Nation tried in vain to give the Daleks their own multimedia empire, independent from Doctor Who itself, but he never succeeded despite two popular films starring Peter Cushing. In 1981, the BBC broadcast a pilot episode of K9 and Company, which saw companion Sarah Jane Smith, played by Elizabeth Sladen, be gifted the titular robot dog K9, voiced by John Leeson. Despite great viewing figures, it was never picked up for a series. Fast forward to the show's revival in 2005, and after it became an instant cultural smash hit, the BBC and Russell T Davis set forth on expanding the show by laying seeds in the series proper that would expand out, namely Torchwood, the series two arc that saw the continuation of the extraterrestrial crime-fighting team, now based in Cardiff, led by the returning Captain Jack Harkness. Then, a few months later, Later, Sarah Jane and K9 would get a second shot at their own spin off with The Sarah Jane Adventures. Both of these shows ran for several highly successful seasons before Torchwood came to an anticlimactic end with the Miracle Day season in 2011. A season so bad that it literally killed off all enthusiasm for the show amongst audiences. And The Sarah Jane Adventures also ended in 2011 after the unfortunate passing of Elizabeth Sladen at the age of 65 due to cancer. Russell T Davis was show running three different shows in the Doctor Who universe at the same time, and it kind of broke his brain, so it seemed appropriate for both spin-off shows to end once Russell passed the showrunner position onto Stephen Moffat. Moffat was working on Sherlock outside of Doctor Who, and the TV landscape was different during the 2010s. Streaming wasn't fully established, but definitely carving a foothold. Doctor Who was still performing well, but was dropping off culturally after the 50th anniversary celebrations, and without an absolute mad lad like Russell T Davis on board with an unhealthy work ethic to single-handedly expand the scope of Doctor Who, there wasn't much internal demand or a desire for another Doctor Who spin-off so the BBC didn't make one. Instead, Network 10 in Australia made another K9 spin-off. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about 2016's Class. Created by young adult author and screenwriter Patrick Ness and the incumbent Doctor Who showrunner Stephen Moffat executive producing, Class ran for eight episodes in late 2016 for BBC Three, the same channel that launched Torchwood a decade earlier but had since moved online. However, unlike Torchwood or the Sarah Jane Adventures, Class never managed to gain an audience during its run, with pretty abysmal viewing figures both in the UK and even in the US, where it was broadcast immediately after Series 10 episodes of Doctor Who, so even its target demographic were changing channels stateside when the show came on. And now, over five years later, no one seems to talk about it. Patrick Ness has moved on to other things, Stephen Moffat handed the showrunner position to Chris Chibnall a year later, and well, it seems like only Big Finish care about class now, because Big Finish care about everything in the Doctor Who universe. Of course there are more Big Finish class episodes than actual televised class episodes. Of course there are. Now for me, Class came out at around the time where I was kind of losing interest in Doctor Who, you know, towards the end of the Stephen Moffat era, so I didn't really watch it at the time, 
time. I also think that just on the face of it, a spin-off like Class just didn't seem like an interesting prospect. Even the setting of Class read almost like bad fanfic. It takes place in the Coal Hill School, a setting that is given a big importance within the show itself without actually being well-defined or even interesting. It's the school where teachers Ian and Barbara worked in the first ever Doctor Who serial in 1963 and where they met the Doctor's granddaughter Susan who was posing as a student there. The school is then not seen until 25 years later when it's the backdrop for a pretty awesome seventh Doctor Dalek story in 1988 and then it's revisited again in 2013 where companion Clara works as a teacher there. And keep in mind that prior to Clara working as a teacher in the day of the Doctor, she has shown no desire or inclination towards becoming a teacher, so it just read as shallow bait for fans. And now, for Coal Hill School, it's been revamped and changed into an academy, which is topical for the time of the show's conception, but now we're in a setting that does not resemble what we've seen on TV before. We've also got an entirely new cast of characters. Torchwood and the Sarah Jane Adventures did branch out and introduce whole new supporting casts, but they were still initially anchored by the established main protagonists like Captain Jack and Sarah Jane. Class really had an uphill battle to ingratiate itself with audiences. But is it any good? Well, I've spent the past week marathoning all eight episodes of the show, and before we talk about it, I want to talk about why I did this video. Because I'm supported on this channel by my patrons. Because of the amount of content ID and copyright stuff I have to go through, I kind of have to rely on my patrons to keep the lights on here and to keep the channel going. So as a sign of appreciation for reaching over 100 patrons, Several months ago, I've had more patrons since then, which I massively appreciate the enthusiasm, and reaching 100 patrons was the goal. If we got 100, I did the class video. So you should be seeing all the patrons' names on screen right now, all of these wonderful people who have supported me, and I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Andrew, James Raby, Dean Jones, Andrew Blewett, Callum Baird, Dylan Whitaker, Flipmeister MK, Harley Jameson, Hunter Graham, Jared Saylor, Jeremy K. Duncan, John Campbell Reese, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Palex, Raven Woods, The Brit Sniper, Toby Loxton, Lily Hu, Dan Morrison, Nathaniel Holden, Samuel Brooks, Zarbi555, Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Christian Rowley, Daniel Davis, Darius, Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, Ginger Animator, Harvey Smith, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, James Morris Wyatt, Joseph Adams, King of the Sandmen, Rebecca Hill, Reese Lloyd, Ricky Temple, Ryan Duncan, Samuel Whitaker, Will, Zach Conway, and Steve Fiore who became a patron right as I was about to hit render on this video, sneaking in just at the last second. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to all of those people and to all of the names on screen right now. All of the names I've read out also got access to a private Mr. Tardis Discord server where we do classic Doctor Who clubs. We talk all things media and Doctor Who in that Discord server. So if you're interested and want to learn more and maybe push me to another stretch goal of like 200, I have no idea what I'll do when I reach 200, but you folks can let me know in the comment section below. But in the meantime, let's talk about class and let's talk about the first episode proper. We'll talk about the opening episode and then branch out from there. So the pilot episode, For Tonight We Might Die, opens in the dark corridors of Coal Hill Academy, where a student is running from shadows and hides in a classroom with a teacher. We hear a gunshot, him screaming, and then a crack opens inside the school. Shadows flood out, which takes us to the opening credits, and... What have I been waiting for? Been wasting all my time. Watching my youth slip away. I, you know, I don't know what I was expecting from an opening title sequence from a young adult Doctor Who spin-off called Class, 
but it definitely wasn't that. This use of Up All Night by Alex Clare with the Rorschach kaleidoscopic opening sure was a choice. I, I don't even mean to be mean here. I I'm just really surprised about this, but I also really warmed to it over time. High energy, pretty cool visuals. Yeah, I, I think I dig it. Anyway, this is the episode where we meet our main cast, almost within the first few minutes. Firstly, we've got April, an idyllic person who's optimistic, wears a heart on her sleeve, and played by Sophie Hopkins. We've got Ram, a jock footballer with a chip on his shoulder, played by Fadi Alsayad. Ram's girlfriend Rachel, who is determined to loosen him up, played by Anna Schaefer. There's Tanya, a child prodigy, and a couple of years younger than the rest of her peers, due to her being moved up several steps, played by Vivian Opera. There's also Charlie, played by Greg Austin, proud but literal-minded and socially awkward. Oh, and that teacher we met in the intro? That's Miss Quill, played by Catherine Kelly, but more on her later. At Coal Hill Academy, the autumn prom is approaching, and April tries to ask Charlie out, but he has no idea what she's insinuating. And then we have Miss Quill awkwardly exposit every main character's defining trait. That's his private property. April McLean. The answer to the question, are spinsters born or made? You got a date for the prom yet? Pretty sure you're not allowed to ask that. I've got a date. Of course you do, Ram. The boy who hears silent applause every time he walks into a room. Long story short, shadows start stalking our main cast, with one even attacking Tanya while she's on a video call to Ram. April stays after school to help decorate the hall for the prom, and is attacked there by the Shadows King. The species are called the Shadow Kin, and this guy is the king of the Shadow Kin, and that never stops being confusing. Miss Quill and Charlie come to rescue April, but the scuffle results in the King's heart becoming displaced with April's, so they share the same heart. If one dies, the other dies. The King leaves, and then about 20 minutes into the pilot, we get a massive info dump explaining the backstory of Quill and Charlie. So, it turns out that Charlie was the Prince of Rhodia, and his species won a war with the Quills. As a form of punishment slash justice, Miss Quill has a tiny creature put in her brain called an Arn, which forbids her from harming Charlie, disobeying him, and using weapons. The Shadowkin attacked Rhodia, killed everyone except for Charlie, who with the help of Quill managed to escape, as well as a blue box appearing in the nick of time to save them, with its pilot, dropping the two of them off in London to start a new life. Now, it's a decent backstory and opening, but it comes thick and fast in a flashback sequence, and it really feels like the story should have maybe opened with this unfolding, instead of a narrativized version from Charlie and Quill. While it's a fun dynamic to have this warrior, who used to work for a terrorist organization or was a freedom fighter, being forced to obey the pampered prince of the race that defeated them, we never actually figure out what happened during this war. Charlie and Quill are on such opposing moral spectrums that we don't know who is right. The Quill lived on the smaller of the southern continents. They mismanaged their economy and grew resentful of our success. The Rhodia ate up all the planet's resources, including those of the Quill, and then they were surprised when we objected. We tried to help you. By making us so dependent that we could never recover. Charlie might be naive, so you'd think that Miss Quill is the one to trust here, but Miss Quill could have been propagandized to. There's no way of objectively knowing, meaning that the audience have no idea how they should feel about this dynamic, which is at the center of two of its main characters. But this backstory, exposited in just a couple of minutes, is so dense that some key details come across as almost throwaway. In this flashback, we see Charlie in front of a box known as the Cabinet of Souls, which is basically the big red button of the whole series. But not only do we not even know what it's called or what it does until the end of the episode, but this scene is also the scene where the Doctor rescues the two characters. It's clear that the audience are going to grab gravitate towards that element of the mythos and completely forget about the cabinet due to it being superseded by the literal main character of the main show of this universe. 
We also have the purpose of Miss Quill's gun explained here, which shoots both ways to kill both the Shadowkin and the person firing it, because apparently that's the only way to kill a Shadowkin. It's part of the internal rules of the show, but the scripts never feel like explaining it properly. These details, this info dump in general, seems like something that might read incredibly well as part of a prologue in a novel, or maybe an interlude where the author can pace themselves to let the audience know the ins and outs of the world and its mythology, and it's really here that you can feel Patrick Ness struggling to make the transition from prose to screenplays. In its current form, with every main character and class being brand new, there's no single audience surrogate or point of reference character to gravitate towards, there's no Captain Jack or Sarah Jane to handhold the audience into this new setting and these supporting characters, meaning that the opening of class really had an uphill battle in getting the viewer on side. However, through sheer force of talent, I did find myself gravitating towards Miss Quill because Catherine Kelly's performance is so textured. We'll talk more about her later, but she absolutely feels like the grown-up in the room, as well as being not quite right. Leave us! We are decorating! April, due to her link with the King of the Shadowkin, knows that they'll arrive to kill Charlie and Miss Quill tomorrow night, and rather than run forever, Charlie insists on standing their ground. Miss Quill has no choice but to obey, so they decide to head to prom and enjoy what could be their last night. Come on, let's dance. For tonight, we might die. Ah, 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 he said it! Tanya is able to convince her overbearing parents to let her attend the prom due to it helping her social development. Charlie goes to prom with fellow student Mateus, played by Jordan Renzo, and Ram attends prom with his girlfriend, who... Okay, so class just kills off someone who seemed lined up to be a main recurring character, out of nowhere, it somehow manages to one-up the first episode of Torchwood. And Ram, covered in the blood of his girlfriend, is confronted by this eight-foot-tall demon guy with swords. And he takes him on, and he smacks him with a chair. You'd expect the jock character to maybe run away in the face of danger, but no, his confident demeanor, in this case at least, is not a put-on. Ram takes action even if it results in him being overpowered by the king, and his right leg gets sliced off. <laughs> Jesus, class is playing hardball, going right for the jugular. The Shadowkin swarm the school. The students manage to evacuate, leaving our main characters, apart from Ram for obvious reasons, confronting the King in the Assembly Hall. But Charlie is unwilling to kill the Shadow King, as that would kill April, and his gun is destroyed. All hope is lost. Nothing left to do then, is there, but to die well. You know, I never thought that was possible. Dying well? Who wants to die well? Surely the aim should be not dying well. You. You. Who? Hey. This is a bit of a mess, isn't it? I used to be the caretaker here, you know. Before it got all fancy, this is going to be quite a clean-up job. You've heard of me, haven't you? You are the great destruction of the universe. Yes, but most people just call me the Doctor. The Twelfth Doctor, played by Peter Capaldi, enters the fray to stop the Shadowkin, after Miss Quill called him a couple of scenes earlier. Through the Doctor's questioning, the King reveals that he's after the Cabinet of Souls, a box that contains the spirits of all the dead Rodians, like an afterlife, but it can also be used as a weapon that can wipe out an entire species, and it's here that this first episode of Class plays its hand, and justifies its Twelfth Doctor appearance thematically, as he's ready to talk Charlie down from using the cabinet to enact revenge on behalf of his dead race. The last of his kind, using a super weapon to wipe out another race? Obviously, the Doctor knows what he's doing in this situation. However, Charlie admits that the cabinet is actually empty, and he's just kept it as a symbolic token. The cabinet is empty. I knew it would be. Every Rodian does. It's just... 
It's just bedtime stories for children to make death less scary. As if death should be anything but terrifying. Then why would you take it? I kept it in memory of my people. All my people who are gone! April threatens to kill herself to get the Shadowkin to leave, and Tanya comes up with the idea of flooding the room with lights to drive them away. Combined with Ram coming in at the last moment, despite having a severed leg, to smack the Shadow King into the portal from whence he came from, the Doctor has seen all he needs to, to know that this is a good group of heroes who he can entrust with the safety of Cold Hill Academy, as this portal is going to act as a beacon for the rest of time and space. He also guilt trips Miss Quill into helping out, because it turns out that that boy at the start of the episode, yeah, Miss Quill tricked him into using the two-way gun to fight off the Shadowkin, and he's dead now. Yeah, that, that plot thread just came and went, didn't it? A willingness to sacrifice themselves to save others. Resourcefulness and bravery. And oh yes, an absolute understanding of how precious life is. The Doctor gifts Ram with an alien prosthetic leg. We get a callback to Clara Oswald and Danny Pink once being staff at the school because this is a post series nine memory wiped Doctor and also a rather mean spirited joke against media study students. Cheer up. It's not that hard. It's no harder than all these exams that you have to take these days. Except for media studies. It's gonna be harder than that. Like, Patrick, who do you think would be qualified to adapt your screenplays and make them into reality. The Doctor leaves this group, colloquially known as the Coal Hill Defenders, and the episode ends with Charlie opening the Cabinet of Souls privately, revealing that it's not actually empty, and his people's spirits are still contained within. Do you know the feeling of dread? Just a side note here, I'm not going to give each episode a full play-by-play, -play, but I just wanted to communicate what the show's first impression was, on me at least. The pilot is a mixed bag, but I think there's a lot of promise here. I think that performance-wise, the cast don't really put a foot wrong. The third act is great, and there is something to be said for the shock value of killing off a main character and how well it casually pairs up Charlie and Mateus, who also becomes a regular cast member. It sets up the story threads well from the threat of the Shadowkin and the connection with April, and I also like how it drops in the main character's parents. These are teenagers, so older than the kids from the Sarah Jane Adventures, but they're still not fully independent, so fleshing out their family life was a smart move. It's these foundations that class builds upon for its next few episodes. Alien invasion or teen angst? Teen angst is a pejorative phrase. When Russell T. Davis took over Doctor Who in 2005, he had a list of rules for the guest writers. One of those rules was, everything you take out of the toy box in each episode, you have to put back in the box by the end credits. Most stories are self-contained with a neat bow to tie it all together. I only bring this up because it becomes apparent really quickly that Class is much more interested in telling a long-form story with its eight-episode series. We get the pilot, and then we get two standalones, a two-parter tying into the Shadowkin, and then a trilogy to conclude. It's not just in the structure of the series that class differentiates itself from its parent show, but in the ethos that unravels from said structure. The Doctor normally just leaves the setting of the week hoping that things get fixed on their own, and while this has bitten him on the arse before, you can probably count those instances on one hand over the past 60 years of TV. The Twelfth Doctor makes a snap judgement about a group of students and their war-hungry alien teacher, leaves them to face threats that can and will try to kill them every week, and never asks if they're okay with this, and never checks in on them. This is demonstrated almost immediately immediately with Tanya's first question once the Doctor leaves at the end of episode one. So, are we all like mates then? 
During the epilogue, Ram and Tanya are talking over webcam, and Ram admits that he'll probably never be okay after what's happened tonight. Yeah, he's got a cool new alien leg, but he still lost his girlfriend, fought an alien king, and he still felt the pain of that leg being severed. It's with episode 2, The Coach with the Dragon Tattoo, that we follow through on this fallout from Ram's perspective. Rachel was killed at the school during the prom, but everyone else is treating her like she's a missing person, with only Ram and the rest of the Coal Hill defenders knowing what's really happened. Ram doesn't even tell his dad, Varun, played by Aaron Neal, and he just bottles everything up. Ram ties a lot of his self-worth into being good at football, and due to the lengthy adjustment period for his new leg, he's not able to return to the sport straight away, which puts him at odds with his football coach, Tom Dawson, played by Ben Peel, who is also carrying an alien dragon tattoo which is killing innocent staff members to maintain its strength. The plot does poke fun at the concept of a bunch of students struggling to work as a team and investigate undercover, culminating in the dragon tattoo killing and skinning the head teacher, Mr. Armitage. It's another surprising way for the series to raise the stakes, especially since Mr. Armitage is actually from Doctor Who proper. He's the head teacher of Cole Hill from series 8. He returns in the first episode of Class and is just killed off here. We've also got a fun subplot with a supposed Ofsted inspector sitting in on Quill's lessons and she cannot stand the scrutiny. It's a clever way to give Quill a subplot that gets around the plot point that she can't fight or use weapons. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you keep writing? Why don't you talk? Whoever you are, I am gonna string you up on that wall by your voice! I don't even understand some of these swear words. He was purposefully provoking me. But the main crux of this episode is Ram learning to stand up to his abusive football coach, who's trying to push him and scare him into performing better on the pitch. It's a pretty thoughtful portrayal of toxic masculinity, and how Ram genuinely respected Coach Dawson until this personality change brought on by the tattoo creature. Ram really has been put through the ringer in these first two episodes, to the point where you'd almost want to laugh if the stakes weren't so high, with Ram watching a dinner lady gets skinned right in front of him. He can't catch a break. He stands up to Dawson, realising the difference between friendly macho competition to push and improve oneself, and just bullying and egotism. The group are able to look into defeating Dawson through a twist that there's two dragons. There's the one in the tattoo, and there's her mate. The mate was the one who killed the head teacher. And Ram basically outmachos the dragon by egging it on into standing up to Dawson, who is holding the female hostage on the skin. It's a pretty clever ending, and you know what? That CGI dragon doesn't look too bad. Oddly enough, Ram also gets advice from Tanya, despite her being a few years younger than him. It's a really mature and unpatronising response into dealing with anxiety and PTSD, and acknowledging that sometimes just talking to someone about it isn't a fix-all solution. But sometimes just being present and opening up at a glacial pace is what's needed, as that's what Tanya did after her dad died of a stroke a couple of years ago. This grief from Tanya is explored in episode 3, Night Visiting, which sees a giant web of vines making their way into the houses throughout East London, and the ends of the vines take the form of deceased relatives trying to coax the victim into taking their hand and being absorbed in. The creature, named the Lankin, is a really great concept, and I love the visual of these vines stretching from window to window on the street, with some people able to resist the temptation, and some getting eaten by the massive creature. There's so much I wanted to tell you, and so much I wanted to say. I know, son. Take your mother's hand and tell her. Hmm? Mama. Son. What was that? A soul saying goodbye. Uh, 
Not as clean as we'd have liked. A lot of anger there. Tanya's father, Jasper, appears in her window with stories and knowledge that only Tanya's father could know, including the reason behind his nickname for her being Puddle. We were watching the regimental horses at Hyde Park. One of them did an absolutely enormous wee, and you, not knowing what it was, jumped right into it. Puddle, 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 you said. Horse wee everywhere. Oddly enough, this isn't the only Doctor Who spin-off where we've got a deceased loved one having to convince someone that they're genuine through an elaborately told story that ends in urine. That night we camped on a beach in Brittany. When we woke up the next morning, a dog was pissing on our tent. This even happens in the Sarah Jane Adventures. What, you don't believe me? What do you think Bubble Shock was made from? Horse wee everywhere. Anyway, it's not just Tanya on the receiving end of the Lankin. Ram gets a visit from Rachel and Quill's sister comes to haunt her as well. I love the potential metaphor at play, with the vines intruding on almost every house, linking everyone in grief in some way, with the loss of someone being an almost universal experience. It's like if you could see the emotions that binded a community, and you can imagine if you were walking down any residential street, who on that street street has suffered loss, well, you'd be able to tell, because they'd have a vine stretching through the window. Even though April doesn't get a visit from the Lankin, at the end of episode 2, her father does try to get in contact with her by phone, a really smart way of tying the themes together without explicitly giving April her own vine. You see, April's father attempted to commit suicide by crashing his car while an 8-year-old April and her mother were inside. This this resulted in April's mum, Jackie, played by Shannon Murray, becoming wheelchair-bound, and her father, Hugh, played by Con O'Neill, going to prison. Well, Hugh's now back, and wanting to reconnect, despite April and Jackie wanting nothing to do with him. It's a nice melding of themes. Here's the problem, though. Everything I told you about that backstory is exposited in this episode through dialogue, where April just tells Ram everything at a bus stop. The plot stops dead, they're literally on the clock because they need to go and rescue Tanya, and they just stop here so they can awkwardly expose it to each other. The same thing happened last episode, with Tanya monologuing to Ram about how she felt when her father died. Considering that the pilot was able to have some visual storytelling with the flashbacks regarding Charlie and Quill, it seems like its storytelling priorities are a bit all over the place. In fact, the whole Ram and April subplot in this stretch of class is really strange because, well, they start seeing each other. In fact, in the next episode, they sleep together and the series never acknowledges this as maybe a rebound on the part of Ram, or some sort of coping or grieving. No, in fact, after Rachel haunts Ram when the Lankin comes knocking, I don't think Rachel is ever mentioned or brought up in any substantial capacity. She is name-dropped occasionally, but only referencing the fact that she was killed. It's such a strange way to evolve Ram's character, considering that the first two episodes set him up in such a compelling way, you know, from losing Rachel, from grieving, opening up to his friends and family, and then it's just dropped, so we can follow a bog-standard teenage romance. If you hadn't realised by now, all of the Coal Hill Defenders are dealing with a lot of shit, even outside of the stresses of being a modern teenager at school. April survived her father's suicide attempt which paralysed her mother, Ram has PTSD from losing his girlfriend and his leg, Tanya is still grieving from losing her dad and feeling isolated because of her intelligence, Miss Quill and Charlie are the last of their kind, even Mateus gets kicked out of his house by his parents because he's gay and the romance between him and Charlie is genuinely lovely and really thoughtfully done. But when it comes to everything that our cast is dealing with, night visiting takes lengths to demonstrate that all trauma is not universal, even if it can be summed up succinctly, like the word grieving. For example, the Lankin is able to appear briefly before Charlie as his parents, but because Rodians see their children as more practical than emotional, there wasn't really much for the Lankin to work with, so they left Charlie 
Charlie alone. Tanya is able to defeat the Lankin by feeding it anger instead of grief because she was angry that she never got closure and she was angry at the Lankin for trying to manipulate her, poisoning the vines and allowing Miss Quill to drive through the vines with a bus severing the connection and sending it back through the portal. Night Visiting is another really interesting episode, really moody, a clever use of a low budget and limited settings as the majority of this story takes place in the main characters' houses, just talking with ghosts. But wait a tick, isn't there a Shadowkin that needs dealing with? Well, that's the next block of episodes, and that's also when the Governors get involved. The next story is a two-parter, co-owner of the Lonely Heart and a Bravish Heart. On the world of the Shadowkin, the king, Korokinus, has been trying to break the bond between him and April, but tampering with the connection has only made it stronger, and this strength starts manifesting, with April being able to summon giant demon swords when provoked to anger. Anger that she takes out on her dad when he turns up unannounced. Ram and April head to April's place afterwards, and the two have sex. However, because April and Korokinus are linked by the heart emotionally, Korokinus also finds himself compelled to sleep with one of the Shadowkin warriors, Karas. And this Shadowkin coitus isn't implied, it's shown. Uh, are you not into it? No, it's just... You're regretting it. As is the king's prerogative. No, it's not that. It's the girl. I trust your majesty satisfied. I don't suppose we could have a moment of cuddling. Class is a strange show. Ram said... April's body's been taken over by the Shadow King. Uh, his voice sounded kind of funny. I think they had sex. <laughs> Ram and the Shadow King. Anyway, yeah, Ram and April are together. And Ram's dead girlfriend from a few weeks ago? Who cares? April's father turns up at her place at the same time Korokinus is attempting to sever the link with Karis's help. It doesn't work, so Korokinus kills Karis, and April, sharing Korokinus' rage, attacks her dad again, but is ultimately able to fight back against the influence and spares him, as well as using her newly acquired shadow powers to heal her mother's paralysis, and she goes through a newly formed portal to the world of the Shadowkin to take the fight to them, with Ram following. Fine, Frodo. Let's go hop in the volcano. Frodo? Yeah. Some old movie my dad likes. <laughs> this interplay between April and Ram during this episode has the drawback in that it kills any sense of urgency. There's no ticking clock for these two to force them to find Korokinus, so they spend most of this episode just talking in the caves, but it does give us a chance to learn more about the history of the Shadowkin, how they consider their existence a mistake, a cruel joke, being creatures of shadow born into a universe of light, and they've built pillars in their caves as a reminder that the universe above will crush them if they don't kill them first. This conversation also leads into Ram talking about his religion and his relationship with his dad. Ram and his dad are Sikh, but Ram doesn't practice Kesh. That's not cutting your hair as a way to accept God's gift of creation. His dad doesn't like this, but still gifted Ram with a kanga, a wooden comb, should Ram change his mind when he's older. This is the cutter. It reminds us that we're part of the community and that our hands and life should do good work. We believe the important thing in your life is to do good action. But if you do a good action, right, somewhere in the process, there's got to be God. Even if you don't have faith or believe there's some dude out there looking after you. Isn't doing a good thing, one human to another, the closest we're gonna get to God? 
It's really cool, and it's great to learn about the religion of a fictional race, and also the generational religious divides in real life. It's just a shame that this episode appears to have to stop dead in order to do it. Once again, this reads as extra detail that would work terrific in a class book, but it feels a bit laboured on screen. April challenges the king to armed combat, and somehow manages to win, despite being a teenage girl who has never used a sword in her life. But her connection to her mother opens another portal, allowing April and Ram's fathers to come through to bring them back home, with Hugh trying to talk April down from the edge. You see, if April kills the king, she'll end up killing herself, but she sees it as the best way to stop the Shadowkin from coming back to Earth again, or wreaking more havoc across the universe. Side note, Con O'Neill is really, really good as Hugh. The performance can sometimes be a bit extra, but this performance pleading to the daughter who he's already lost was really powerful. You took the terrible thing I did to you and you threw it back at the world and you said, not me. You said, I've got my own rules I want to live by. I mean, for God's sake, you got all these, these superhero powers and the first thing you did was, was heal your mum. That's who you are. Even me, the worst dad in the world, can see that. So please, 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 be you right now. Don't be me. Even I don't want to be me anymore. April spares the Shadow King, but because she won the battle, she's now the new king. She orders the Shadow Kin to imprison Korokinus and they return to Earth, only to run straight into the B-plot of this two-parter. Okay, let me back up. During this two-parter, Charlie has opened up to Mateus about the Rhodian spirits in the Cabinet of Souls, and Miss Quill overhears, which is good timing because East London is being besieged by some pink flower petals which have started to multiply. In a really cool detail, the episode opens on one just drifting down like the opening shot of Forrest Gump, and as the episode progresses, they start dominating the background more and more until we learn that they're actually carnivorous. These petals feed off blood and multiply at such a rate that they'll smother the earth in about a day. This is exposited by the new head teacher, Dorothea, played by Pookie Quesnel, one of the governors who has been observing Miss Quill for some time. That Ofsted inspector from episode 2? That was them. Oh, and he turned out to be a robot. I forgot to mention that, like I said, this show is wild. Anyway, Dorothea wants Charlie to use the Cabinet of Souls to wipe out the petals, but it will also wipe out the last vestiges of the Rodians, and according to children's stories, it might even be a way of bringing them all back, but it will still take over another entire race. Dorothea and the governors promise to remove the alien creature from Quill's head in exchange for Quill convincing Charlie to use the Cabinet against the petals, by force. Quill, however, decides to only meet Dorothea halfway. She's going to try and convince Charlie to wipe out the Shadowkin to take revenge on them wiping out both of their races, because, honestly, Quill could not care less about her own life and would rather see their enemy defeated than survive against the Petals. But Mateus is adamant that Charlie not become the killer that he's worried he can become. By the end of the episode, Charlie is holding the big red button in his hands and declares his intent to the Cabinet of Souls to use it as a weapon. But April uses the Shadowkin to wipe out the Petals, preventing Charlie from having to go through with it and leaving it ambiguous as to whether or not he would have killed the Petals or the Shadowkin. Korokinus, from his prison cell, is able to destroy the newly formed anchor between him and April, somehow, which causes her to lose her powers. Yeah, it's a really major detail in a story capacity, but I have no idea how he did it. In character for April, she goes to check that her mum's paralysis has still healed, and apparently it's still there but she spent this entire episode still in the chair, so it feels a bit like a wasted opportunity. Like, I'm not expecting April's mum to be jump-kicking anytime soon, but it feels like there's narrative potential on the table in this episode, and it never really gets explored. 
Apart from that though, this appears to tie things up a bit too nicely, to be honest. This two-parter reads a lot like a series finale, with the super weapon getting brought out, complex moral choices, and the return of the Shadowkin with the King's defeat. However, believe it or not, this isn't the finale. It's actually the moving of the pieces to get us to the finale proper, the final three episodes, a trilogy of stories which brings class to an end, and all hell breaks loose. The next episode picks up the following week. It's Monday, and Miss Quill puts Charlie in detention. They arrive at the classroom, and we discover that all of the Coal Hill defenders are there. Quill locks them in, because it turns out that Dorothea's offer of getting the arm removed from her head still stands, so she's off to go and do that. It's not long, however, until a meteor flies through the tear in space and time and crashes into the room, smashing them into a never-ending void. This episode is detained otherwise known as that really, really good episode of the Doctor Who spin-off class by fans, colloquially. With seemingly no way to escape this void and tensions rising, Matthias tries to get rid of the meteor fragment, only for it to seemingly possess him and compel him to confess a dark truth, that he's scared of Charlie. Prodigy Tanya is able to put together the clues that being near the meteor is causing everyone to become progressively angrier. Tanya is the next one to grab the rock and reveals that she doesn't consider everyone to be her friend and she sees herself like a younger sister who everyone looks down on. Tanya, however, is able to use this time with the rock to communicate with it. If everyone asks Tanya a question about the rock, she is compelled to tell the truth. With this, they discover that holding onto the rock for too long destroys the brain, and there's a prisoner trapped inside of it. This, this right here, is terrific writing. So our cast are trapped in a room with a rock, and the longer they're in there, the angrier and more violent they get. However, the only way out is to communicate with the prisoner inside of the rock for answers, but they only have a limited time holding the rock, and they can only do it the amount of times that corresponds with the amount of people in that room, and whoever holds the rock is compelled to reveal dark secrets. It's such a great vehicle for drama and tension. Detained is possibly the most bottle episode to ever bottle episode, whose literal premise requires the cast to speak the truth with no hope of withholding peace. It's such an audacious use of the television trope that even if this episode wasn't very good, I'd still respect the hell out of it. But the fact that Detained is an incredibly well-directed and brilliantly acted 40 minutes of TV is quite a marvel as well. When getting ready to marathon this series, I saw a lot of people wondering why on earth are the Call Hill Defenders even friends with each other, and their behaviour in Detained was the example that got cited the most. However, they establish in the episode that being near the rock is what is making them angrier and more violent. In fact, the ticking clock is that they were Will eventually kill each other if they can't get out of this situation. But even if that plot point wasn't the case, everything leading up to Detained really works in regards to the antagonism. We established in the pilot that these kids have just been lumped together by fate and a madman in a box with no regard to their own wants and desires. They've been traumatised, they share in each other's grief and trauma and complicated relationship dynamics. These are people who want to be friends with each other, but they're just living out the most extreme versions of what it means to be a teenager in the 21st century. They've been moulded together by authority figures and power structures and are just expected to accomplish the impossible balance of growing up and achieving their own desires. Ram was a football prodigy whose leg got sliced off. April learned way too early that the world was not safe and even her own parents could try and take her out of it. Tanya's intelligence means nothing in an environment where she's so socially looked down upon. There's even something to be said for the evolution of Coal Hill as a setting in and of itself. It changes from Coal Hill School to Coal Hill Academy off screen and it's emblematic of real life changes in the education system in the UK, where schools were, in massive quotes, 
upgraded into academies to give schools more autonomy and control, but in actuality, this has just resulted in the increased rigidity of academic structures, standardized testing, and less accountability to those within the school's communities. Oh, and look, Coal Hill also happens to be run by a shadowy organization called the Governors. Isn't that just the subtext becoming the text all of a sudden? I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Heck, maybe even the plot point of Quill's arn in her head preventing her from using weapons or antagonizing the cast could be a commentary on the restraints put on teachers in a school setting. In the face of all of this, it's why I also find Mateus such a refreshing character in this dynamic. He gets kicked out of his parents' house because of his sexuality, and obviously that's not nothing, but it's a much more grounded conflict than, oh, my deceased dad appeared at my window possessed by an alien vine, or my heart is tethered to a shadow king underneath the universe. These heightened genre interpretations of the teenage experience are accompanied by reams of experience position, explanations of motive and emotions, but Matthias, conversely, is much more straightforward with his rhetoric, and he cuts right through the conflict of every situation he's placed in which is why his revelation hurts Charlie so much. But if these truths aren't spoken in this episode, the cast will end up killing each other. It's when Ram picks up the rock that they discover that each rock in the meteor field had a prisoner bound to it, and the prisoner here, in this classroom, was a murderer, and was locked up with four others who, well, they're not in that rock anymore, if you can catch my drift. Unfortunately, to get this information, Ram confessed that he loves April, but knows that she doesn't love him as much, a paranoia compounded when April next picks up the stone, and confirms this. Oh, and the prisoner is gaining strength and gets a freaky voice. He's got his confession now. Just ask me something. Where are we? Here and nowhere. Not an answer. You are in no time, no space. You will not escape. You will not escape. Charlie, struggling to cope with claustrophobia, decides to take the matter into his own hands and elects to confess his darkest secrets without grabbing the stone first, to try and force the prisoner to confess an escape route for them without feeding on him first. I want to murder the Shadow King. Every last one. I want to use the Cabinet of Souls to wipe them from the face of existence. But... Charlie. I would lose you. I would lose myself. I would lose all hope of anything good ever again. But I want to do it. I think of it every day, and the only thing that stops me is you. Sometimes. Sometimes I hate you for it. He then grabs the stone. He tries to fight the influence, but it turns out he's got one more confession left. I love you. It's the truth. It's also true that I lose you. And because on Rhodia, a wish is the same as an action, so wanting to murder the Shadowkin is the emotional equivalent of actually doing it, Charlie becomes the guiltiest person in that prison cell, killing the other prisoner and blasting them back into reality, but almost getting sucked back into the newly emptied prison, only to be rescued by Miss Quill. Armed with a blaster that she's now able to use, a scar across her eye, and much longer hair. How can you fire a gun? You do not want to talk to me after the day I've had. Day? You've only been gone 45 minutes. Me? It seemed like a lifetime. The next episode, the metaphysical engine, or what Quill did, 
takes place concurrently with Detained, and follows Miss Quill on a mission with Dorothea to get the Arn removed from her brain. Also recruited is Balon, played by Chike Okonkwo, a shapeshifting alien whose abilities were frozen mid-transformation. Balon has been hiding on Earth as a Zygon, a protected species on Earth, which is a pretty clever reference to Series 9 of Doctor Who. Dorothea has a metaphysical engine, which allows the trio to travel to areas that are imagined as if they were real, and this device takes them on a trip, to the birthing ground of the Arn, apparently impossible because the Arn are genetically modified and grown, but because the Arn themselves believe in a homeworld, believe in their heaven, the metaphysical engine can take them to that birthing ground to get a specimen. This trip also takes Balon to his species idea of hell, where they face off against the devil to extract its blood before going to the concept of Quill Heaven and encounter the birth of the Quill Goddess. And what does Miss Quill do when she sees the imagined but now real and made manifest, the literal god of her lost people? She tries to beat the shit out of it and gives it a piece of her mind. You don't deserve my bliss! Do you know how oppressed Quill have been for centuries? We died! And died again and where were you? I should rip your head off for even daring to exist! Do it! Now seems like a pretty good time to talk about Miss Quill generally. Performance-wise, the whole cast are pretty good, but Catherine Kelly is by far and away the MVP. She's so astonishingly good in this role throughout this series that I would genuinely love for her to be promoted to Doctor Who proper as a regular cast member, alongside the likes of Kate Stewart or River Song. She's perpetually out of place, giving a very different performance and physical presence to everyone else, which makes sense because she's definitely not human, but her sardonic nature and frequent put-downs don't just make her really entertaining, but do belie a very real grief at the hands of the Rodians and the Shadowkin. The fact that Kelly can switch between these two traits on a dime is enthralling to watch. You have a weapon that could kill all the Shadowkin right now. You'd leave this world to its destruction. Ah. Oh. Destruction. That's a small price to pay for the destruction of our enemy. You are heartless. Like all Quill. No, I am grieving, Prince. You call me a terrorist. You call me a slave. You call you slave. Everything I did, everything was for my people. For the proud Quill who saw their life taken from them by the greedy Red I Red. never took anyone's life. She's simultaneously the smartest person in almost every room that she's in, but literally unable to be proactive. For her, this life of slavery is a fate worse than death, so when she's told that she can have the Arna removed but she might die in the process, it's a no-brainer. Quill is lonely. Her upbringing with a primal and antiquated species that forces newborns to kill their mothers in the nest has hardened her against her will, but now she looks back on those traditions fondly, because those memories are all that's left of her people now. Something that makes this journey, thanks to the metaphysical engine, even more profound to her. Quill is able to shout her supposed power, her supposed strength and authority. You think the same plan will work? But I am what waits for you! And I am war itself! She's either shouting it to shadows or to children. You know, this planet, it, it never ceases to stop talking about luck and fate and destiny. Well, I believe in none of those things. I believe life tries to kill you from the moment you are born, and the only proper response is to fight back at every moment. But with the metaphysical engine, she can do anything or go anywhere if her belief is strong enough. So, with the head of the Quill Goddess, the three return back to Coal Hill. Dorothea leaves to debrief with the governors as Balon performs the surgery on Quill to remove the Arn. And in writing and editing this video, I've been debating back and forth as to whether or not I play any clips from this scene, because I've watched most of Doctor Who, I've watched all of Torchwood, and I think the surgery scene in class contains the most gruesome moment of gore in the entire on-screen canon of Doctor Who. 
The surgery is a success, but it leaves Quill with a nasty scar. Quill, with a newfound freedom and high off the success, sleeps with Balon. They wake up the next morning and attempt to leave the school, only to discover that they're trapped in the Cabinet of Souls. Apparently, being on Rhodian soil increased the likelihood of the surgery's success, but Dorothea knew that Quill would never come here of her own accord. But the metaphysical engine only has enough power for one of them to leave. Quill is given her gun. Balon is told that his niece, thought to be dead, is still alive, and the two are left to fight it out. We just fought side by side. I know. You have no loyalty on the battlefield. I know. <laughs> But if a soldier isn't fighting for the safety of his family, why does he fight at all? After a struggle, Balon eventually gets his hands on the blaster, begging Quill to turn around so he doesn't have to look at her when he kills her. Look away. I will not. Do it. Forgive me. Oh, I do. No! The gun was set to backfire, killing Balon, and leaving Quill to bury her fellow soldier, and leave the Cabinet of Souls on her own. With time passing differently in the cabinet, it's several weeks and months before Quill is able to muster the physical strength to crawl her way out of the cabinet, newly reborn with a newfound freedom, having fought and suffered on both Rhodia and its heaven, having toiled through four different afterlifes in this episode to get to where she is now. Miss Quill, war itself, is finally free, and apparently several months pregnant after sleeping with Balon, which takes us to the ending of Detained, and towards the series finale. A lot of people cite Detained as the best episode, but for me, it's the metaphysical engine or what Quill did. That's my favourite. But we're still not done! Because the final episode, The Lost, opens with Korakinus, once again the king of the Shadowkin, leading an invasion of Earth, and murdering Ram's father and Tanya's mother. The group are alienated after the personal revelations towards each other entertained, and while Miss Quill is back, she's hibernating, and no one has any idea what she'll do when she wakes up again. The Lost starts incredibly strongly, to the point where this is where class peaks as an impactful TV show. In the past few episodes, it's taken some massive swings that even shows like Torchwood never really committed to, despite being for an older audience. It means that The Lost, however, really has nowhere else to go but downhill from here, and while the finale doesn't really stumble too much, there isn't really anything that hits as hard as the opening act. Also, side note, I was genuinely sad to see Ram's dad killed off here. I haven't talked much about him in this video, and that's because his role, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't that big, but Aaron Neal was always great whenever he appeared. Ram's dad learns about what's been happening at Cold Hill quite early on in the series, and he also learns about Ram's prosthetic leg. You never told me there were going to be more monsters. You didn't want to know, Dad. I always want to know! If the world is going to end in shadows or in petals, I want to know, son! He's really supporting, promising not to tell Ram's mum what's been going on. He supports Ram as best he can, getting back into football despite his leg issues, and it's during one of these training sessions that he's violently stabbed in the back by Korakinus, the same way Rachel was killed seven episodes ago. How are they back? I had them destroyed the path of our world. I don't know, but my dad... Where's your mum? Leeds. She's at a convention. I haven't called her yet, April. What do I say? God, that's powerful. So, what are the Shadowkin doing this for? Basically, unable to properly break the link between himself and April, 
Korokinus offers an ultimatum. He'll keep killing those closest to her unless she hands herself over, being imprisoned forever. And if a Doctor Who spin-off finale that revolves around a demonic big bad whose weapon is Shadow killing those closest to the cast in order to convince them into doing something that will result in the destruction of their world sounds familiar to you, that's because it's almost identical to the plot of the finale of Series 1 of Torchwood, End of Days. Though unlike End of Days, The Lost doesn't have a do-over at the end, but I think that's less to do with class wholeheartedly committing to the consequences and more because this finale feels like it's setting up a series two instead of telling a final chapter. Quill does wake up and agrees to train Tanya to fight, as well as follow through with her intentions earlier of forcing Charlie to use the Cabinet of Souls against the Shadowkin, but Quill's pregnancy does not get resolved in this series. It turns out that the Shadowkin were able to get back to Earth due to some unintended consequences of the Governor's actions, but we'll touch on that later. But I will say that never gets fully explained or resolved, neither does a bunch of loose plot threads and just full-blown cliffhangers. A lot of stuff in The Lost is getting set up, and while there are some really nice character beats and moments, they're either treading ground from the last time Charlie was torn about using the cabinet to wipe out the Shadowkin, or they're really rushed, like Quill taking pity on Tanya and training her how to fight and channel her anger. Good idea, good concept, it builds on Tanya's anger that was established in Night Visiting, but it's not really credible for a 14-year-old girl to fight against the Shadowkin because she learned a couple of handy moves from a pregnant alien. Do this. 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 Great, you can defend yourself against a pregnant woman. April leaves Ram a voicemail message saying that she does love him, but this is because of some off-screen soul-searching that has happened between episodes, so it's quite underwhelming. But speaking of soul-searching, the added wrinkle to using the cabinet this time is that Korokinus has put a piece of shadow on Charlie, meaning that if he uses the cabinet, he will die as well. In the assembly hall, the cabinet has been placed there by Quill and Tanya, the latter of whom begs Charlie to use the cabinet after her brothers are attacked in the library, but they manage to escape. April arrives and gives herself over to Korokinus under the condition that Earth is safe. But because the two are telepathically linked and they're so close together, she learns that this is a lie. Under April's instructions, Charlie shoots and kills her, which also kills Korokinus, and because of the Shadowkin line of succession, that turns Charlie from Prince of Rhodia to King of the Shadowkin. He goes to the cabinet to finish the job, all the while Mateus is begging Charlie to not sacrifice himself. Charlie, please. And he does it. The cabinet opens, the Rhodian spirits wipe out every last Shadowkin, and just as the last soul is about to kill Charlie as well, Quill pushes him out of the way, and the last soul goes somewhere. Honestly, I really like this last moment of heroism from Quill. Obviously, she's resented Charlie this whole season, something that's not really been reciprocated because of Charlie's naivete. Mm -hmm. I haven't even restrained her, though. If she wakes, she's a threat to you. It's been almost a week. She hasn't even woken. I, I pour water down her throat, but... You care for her? With the last of our kinds. It would... <sighs> I wouldn't... You wouldn't have a heart if she did not care. But with the Arn now removed, and their dynamic untainted under the threat of death and servitude, I think Quill takes pity on Charlie, and respects his decision to make the sacrifice when he needed to. But Charlie does not see it that way. Oh, they're gone, all of them! They're gone! I should be gone with them! I was so stupid. I, I thought I might be the hero. I thought I was bringing them back. I, I thought the souls would be reborn. And then, a previously dead Korokinus gets up from off the floor and... Why is everyone looking at me like that? <laughs> then, 
that's how class ends. Oh, but we do have one last scene to talk about. So Dorothea goes back to report to the governors who are upset that Charlie used the closest doomsday weapon to hand, with them originally speculating that Charlie was too moral to use the cabinet. It turns out that the governors are less a school body and more like a cult who are anticipating something called the arrival, but Dorothea will not live to see it as the governors turn their back to her. setback is temporary. We will be ready for the arrival. Oh yes. We will be ready on that glorious day. We then see what appears to be a piece of artwork at the back of the room, teasing what this arrival is. Some sort of apocalyptic event where a giant weeping angel is looming over humanity. So, yeah. That's where class ends, with a lot of cliffhangers. I respect the ambition of using your series finale to tease into the future, but in retrospect, it really lessens the impact of the series as a whole. As far as I'm aware, Expanded Media hasn't taken the story any further than Bravish Heart Episode 5, so the next chapter of class may never be told. But let's talk some generalities before I wind up this video. A consistent high point of class was the music by Blair Mowat. The ending credits theme is an absolute banger, as is the music during the climaxes of Detained and The Lost, which are incredible tracks that can rival Murray Gold works. Though I do think the show relies on licensed music a bit too much, especially during dramatic moments. The scene where Charlie kills April is underscored by a really inappropriate licensed piece of music. Black is the colour of my true love's hair Her lips lie It's so bad to the extent where, if Class had been seen by enough people when it originally aired, it could have become a meme in the vein of the OC Series 2 finale. While I assume the show had a low budget, I do think that the creature effects and the makeup were great throughout, with the directing MVP being Wayne Yip, who directed Detained and What Quill Did. He would go on to direct some Series 10 stories of Doctor Who, peaking with his great work on the 2019 New Year's Day special, Resolution. I really liked the decision early on to include the parents so much. The emphasis on side characters and family members was started by Russell T. Davis on Doctor Who back in 2005. It made its way into torch with the sarah jane adventures and i'm really glad that it still found its way into class however one holdover from the stephen moffat era also made its way here and not for the better and that's the strange ambiguity of just how much earth knows about alien life honestly week after week people get killed massive city-wide events take place and there's an insane amount of collateral damage done to the school itself but the cast just turn up at school the next episode, and it just seems like business as usual. For a spin-off show that's trying to remain grounded and is just eight episodes long, it does become a really awkward element of the world that never gets addressed to the show's detriment. The governors have done an analysis of the probability of the number of so- <laughs> I'm sorry, you were saying? Those aren't free, you know. Like, this line is meant to be a joke, but even at the end of this series' low-budget bottle episode, Detained, it leaves the classroom in tatters and the windows have been blown out. Like, why has the issue of budget repairs only been mentioned here and now? <sighs> but I can't stay mad at class. 
When I announced that I was doing this video, I was bombarded with messages and tweets telling me to tear into the series and some people even wishing me luck because of how bad it is and how hard it would be to sit through. For years, Class has been hyped up as this show that's terrible and worthy of scorn, but... I'm sorry folks, I, I just can't meet you there. I'm sorry if, if that's disappointing, but not only do I think that class, its numerous loose ends aside, is really good TV, but I think in terms of Doctor Who spin-offs, it's the best first series out of the lot of them. Class may get off to a shaky start as it struggles to establish its setting and its cast in the first episode, and its finale may focus more on setting up a potential second series, but the six episodes in between are really strong young adult sci-fi. I think it does a great job at capturing the complexities and the ugliness of growing up and finding yourself in an environment that's so stacked against you, in pinning down these anxieties that are heightened but are universal, with some pretty decent humour and a varied cast of characters along the way, with Miss Quill and Catherine Kelly's fierce performance being such a revelation. Patrick Ness's other work, most notably A Monster Calls, focuses on how ugly things like sorrow and grief can be, and I like how class doesn't sanitise or dumb down its emotions. I adore how actors like Greg Austin and Fadi Alsayad really lean into male vulnerability, and while April at times comes across as a bit of a wallflower, I do think that Sophie Hopkins is able to make the quiet anger that is forced out of her credible. I even like how the story doesn't just say, yeah, April is the kind one, but it actually asks, what does being kind even mean? And it removes the layers to show what that kindness is compensating for. If there's a weak link in the cast, it's Tanya, and not because of Vivian Oprah, but because the child prodigy that's more like the younger sister is not a dynamic that's properly explored within the series. She does get good moments, and episode 3, Night Visiting, is absolutely about her, furiously grieving her father, but her dynamic within the Coal Hill Defenders is not given much airtime. But even if I could walk away from this marathon and say that class is not very good, I'd at least respect it for dedicating its eight episodes to dealing with complex topics like toxic masculinity, shared mourning, distancing yourself from toxic family, suicide, intimate confessions, the afterlife, and more. Class burned quickly, but it absolutely burned brightly. And if you're someone who, like me, was turned off from checking it out for years because of the stigma surrounding it or issues you had with Doctor Who at the time of its broadcast, then I urge you to give Class at least a couple of episodes. And in the end, after this marathon, while it is, obviously, way too late, if Class ever did get a Series 2, I would absolutely be there day one. But because no audience, myself included, turned up for it on its first go around, it's unlikely it will ever happen. So, what did go wrong? What happened here? I, I, I didn't get to it. Uh, I think I, I think I basically missed class. Mm. Um, you, you, weren't, you weren't. You weren't. the only one. You weren't the only no, one. There's quite, no. there's quite a few. Quite it's a few not... people who missed it when it was on. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, was, it wasn't marketed very heavily, so I'm not surprised. No, you it was. It. it wasn't. It wasn't. Shamefully, it wasn't marketed yeah. very heavily. It's no secret that while the Doctor does appear in the first episode, and there's a couple of callbacks and references in the show itself, Class was never initially pitched as a Doctor Who spin-off within the BBC. It was a young adult sci-fi show from Patrick Ness that had the Doctor Who license bolted onto it quite late into pre-production. And when Class was formally announced, honestly, I think the Doctor Who fandom was in a bit of a cynical place, myself included. Series 9 had just started, people were starting to lose patience with Stephen Moffat and the show's creative direction, and, oh, what's this? The most generic-sounding series ever? No thanks. What makes you think that they'll accept your spin-off idea? They've commissioned a young adult series called Class, Will. I think I've got a good innings. It's darker, it's sexier, it's right here, right now, and an even bigger war is coming. Seminar is coming. 
It also doesn't help that the BBC was really quiet with updates. And apart from a very dedicated online social media campaign, there was zero marketing for the show outside of the odd poster, Peter Capaldi using a Snapchat dog filter, and a bunch of inane buzzwords like sexy, right now, and it's a show with heart. We didn't know. There was no way we could have known. Class started five minutes ago. It's, it's so dark. It's so sexy. It's so right now. Oh, God! It's so right now. It's practically tomorrow. And then they just dumped the show online on Saturday mornings with no fanfare. And when it did air on BBC One months later, it was during a late night graveyard slot and once again, never promoted. But there was also the Classmates Online show. Yeah, bet you thought I forgot about this, didn't you? Classmates was an online reaction series that starred a group of Doctor Who YouTubers like Crispy Pro, Don Martin, Crystal D, Jenny Lipman, and more. These videos were basically there to hype up the series. Now, no disrespect to any of these people involved. Many of them are people I've collaborated with, but it did feel on the face of it very artificial, probably because of how overly positive everyone is. Now, I've got no idea what the creative process was for this online series, but it seems like the premise of getting a bunch of online, quote, classmates to give positive reviews of the show no one was watching did not have much sustainability to it. And while the first three episodes of Classmates have got 10 people giving their impressions of the show, by episode four, it's literally just one person talking about it. Detail and what Quill did, in my opinion, two of the best episodes of the show, only got reviews from Gerard Groves and Crystal D. I could have gone and asked these people what went on behind the scenes here, but I really didn't want to, especially since many of the classmates aren't actually active in the fandom anymore, and I don't think they want to be bothered. But it is an interesting moment in Doctor Who YouTube history, you know, back in the days when the BBC were okay with people reviewing and reacting to their content online. How times change. While I'm sure it was made with the best of intentions and from a dedicated social media online team, it was perceived as a cynical attempt to try and get the fandom on side rather than letting class prove itself. There's also the element of the marketing team putting together a Whovian style term, you know, classmates, for a show which hadn't even garnered a following yet. Normally it's the fans who coin a term like Whovian, not the show itself. Hey, future Mr. Tardis here while editing this video. Uh, so in light of me bringing up classmates on Twitter, a few people involved in classmates did get in touch with me. While I won't name names, I can say and corroborate that Classmates, upon its initial release, was met with a really hostile reaction from the online fan base. And these Hootubers, who keep in mind, some of them were really young, some of them were teenagers, and they only had small platforms, received a lot of abuse and harassment. Insults were hurled, conspiracy theories were shared, sexist and racial slurs were thrown, and the videos were downvoted into oblivion. Even though Classmates isn't really my thing, the creators behind it don't deserve hate and insults and conspiracies thrown at them. I'm also glad that, in light of the harassment that the Classmates were getting from the videos, the series creators were supportive towards those on the receiving end of it behind the scenes, which apparently was the reason for the downsizing later on, just so that these people wouldn't be harassed anymore. So yeah, that was a depressing chapter in fandom, wasn't it? You know, once again, the Doctor Who community having a completely normal day, crying out loud. But the main killer was the BBC, the broadcaster, who never seemed to have much public faith in class. The viewing figures were dismal, and it was cancelled shortly after broadcast. Patrick Ness was very open online about not returning to the show, even if it did get renewed, spilling the beans on where the story would have gone had it continued. On Twitter, he said, it has been the most amazing experience. I loved it, and I'm so proud of the show and what we made. My heart just bursts with happy. Huge thank yous to BBC Three and BBC America for their love and enthusiasm for class. I remain baffled by the scheduling decisions of BBC One, which were odd for a critically acclaimed show, but once again, I'm so grateful for the chance. So thank you to everyone who watched and loved it, and argued about it and watched it again. You made my heart swell. And if I'd got a second season, Weeping Angel Civil War and Planet, Quill has a dangerous son, 
Charlie and Mateus shirtless wood chopping. In a five years later retrospective article for the Radio Times, Patrick Ness also opened up a bit more about what Series 2 would have entailed, with April striking a monkey's paw type deal with the governors to get her body back. Also, new writers would have been introduced for Series 2, including Juno Dawson, who was going to write a Ferris Bueller homage starring Tanya, exploring perhaps being pan or bisexual. Writer Kim Curran was also in talks to pen an episode called Time Capsule, which would have seen the cast zapped back to Coal Hill in the 1990s, and the key to getting home revolving around a time capsule that they knew was buried under the school. Derek Landy was also part of the trio of new writers, planning an episode about internet fame, fan entitlement, and online backlash, but nothing was ever committed to paper proper. I really recommend reading this article from the Radio Times, as it seems that Ness and the cast aren't bitter about what happened to the show. They're disappointed, sure, but incredibly proud of the work that they did, and I think they've earned that pride. As I said earlier, Big Finish and a couple of novels have expanded the class universe, but nothing beyond the series 1 cliffhanger ending, but I can safely say that class deserved a better fate than it ultimately got. I also think it's as strong as it was because unlike other spin-offs, it's shepherded by a single writer. Patrick Ness wrote every episode, which gives the show a real sense of consistency. Class does feel like a singular creative vision. I'd like to take this moment to thank Patrick Ness for his short-lived but ambitious and thought-provoking stamp on the Doctor Who universe. And, you know, I'm sorry that it wasn't watched at the time, that it was dismissed out of hand in 2016. It deserved a better fate, because class, all things considered, is pretty darn good. That's the opposite of what class sounds like. I'm so glad that I kept the beard for this video. Like, I can do the thoughtful, like, contemplative. Hmm. 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 Looking back, I should have worn a tweed jacket. Like, gone for the full teacher thing. Bearded hipster teacher. You know, come on, kids. We're gonna, we're gonna learn about history.